Let us pray. The prayer, I will pray for illumination. Let us pray. Speak to us, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors through the voices of your prophets, the breath of your spirit, and the life of your son, so that we may live according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament. It's from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 9. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Here ends the first reading. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through the first half of verse 32. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, who do the people say I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable before you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It seems like such an ordinary thing to do. Pick up a Bible off the shelf and start to read it. It is still the most printed book in human history in the world, 
Uh, about 80 million copies or so are printed worldwide every single year. For a total of people who care about these things have thought maybe five or seven billion printed in the almost 600 years since the printing press was invented. When we look at a contemporary translation, uh, even look at it online or on our smartphones, it can be easy to forget what makes this book unlike any others. Yes, as Christians, we call it the word of God, but it didn't drop from the hands of angels uh, in the sky like um, in the King James Version of 413 years ago. The Bible is the result of at least a thousand years, a thousand years of people experiencing God and eventually writing those stories down and those experiences down. Over time, some of these writings became so revered that a group of people decided that these particular writings, I'm gonna to point to this pulpit Bible, these particular writings would be the authoritative writings for us. First, the Hebrew Bible was solidified by the first century AD, or what is now called the Common Era, CE. Then by around 400, the books of the New Testament were decided. There are, were variations, of course, along the way, but for 1,600 years, this book has guided and inspired people of faith. It has helped seekers and Christians know about Jesus' life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection translating it into languages that each of us understand and yet is also somehow true to the original text, this is not easy. But major new English translations seem to come out every 20 years or so. I can only imagine the same thing happens in other languages. Saying the original text when we talk about the Bible is also a little bit misleading. There is not one original text, but many. If you look at the footnotes in many Bibles, I haven't checked the Pew Bibles, but my guess is that they're in there too. You'll see that they will highlight when there is a discrepancy with different between different handwritten source documents called manuscripts. This sermon series, Gospel According to Unexpected Sources, is based on one I preached uh, years ago, previously in a, when I pastored a congregation in Colorado. That congregation planned an outing, a little field trip, to the Denver Museum uh, to see a touring exhibit of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, it made quite a splash uh, quite a few years ago. Perhaps some of you saw that exhibit when it came east. The Bible is by no means an unexpected source of the gospel. That's an oxymoron, really. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are a bit of a puzzle. They are ancient, yet only discovered in living memory for some people around here. I thought to myself as people were entering, I'm going off manuscript for a moment, uh, you know, this isn't quite the draw that Taylor Swift <laughs> the gospel according to Taylor Swift or the gospel according to the Beatles was. Uh, so thank you for being in worship today when you, if you might have seen the words Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are alive. They are not sea scrolls that have died because you could read those words and interpret them that way. They are scrolls found near the Dead Sea in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is called dead because it is so salty that almost nothing can live in it, especially not fish, and I think not even plankton. Anyone been in the Dead Sea? I see a few hands. You float like crazy. It is 10 times as salty as the ocean, and it is 20 times deeper and much saltier than the Great Salt Lake in Utah. 
Over 75 years ago, wandering into a cave in the dusty brown cliffs near the Dead Sea, a Bedouin, an Arab nomad, discovered clay jars. They're sort of like this, because they rest in holders. So they're like this. Discovered clay jars containing seven ancient scrolls that turned out to be very, very important. And again, this was only 75 years ago. Over the next nine years, archaeologists and nomads found over 950 different manuscripts, many of which were in fragments. And when I say this, there are over 50,000 fragments. 200 of the scrolls are books from the Hebrew Bible. There are 30 copies of the book of Deuteronomy by just alone. The most complete scroll from the Bible is the Isaiah scroll, which measures 24 feet long. I don't know. Would that reach to the back of the sanctuary? Is that 24 feet or no? I see. Is it not that long or is it longer? Shorter. Okay. All right. It's very long for a scroll. Uh, you can see this scroll displayed in the shrine of the book in Jerusalem. It's beautiful. They built the whole building around the exhibit case for the Isaiah scroll. Other manuscripts are of religious books that we sometimes call the Apocrypha because they did not make it into the final official version of the Hebrew Bible. They are also, there are also what are called sectarian manuscripts that talk about the life of the religious community that lived in Qumran where those cliffs are located. While many of the biblical scrolls may be older, members of the community clearly wrote much of that sectarian material. So the question that a good preacher always asks, or at least in my mind should ask, is so what? Why should we care about a dozen or so caves in Israel, Palestine, and the scrolls that they contain? Since almost all of us gathered here revere and I hope read the Bible, it's important that we have some sense of how the Bible came to be. To become U.S. citizens, immigrants have to study and take a history test about the United States, about its government and its history. Those of us born here uh, in uh, born here in the United States, might have to rely on those fifth grade classes to remember some details about the Constitution, its framers, and its forebear, the Magna Carta, although living in Virginia, this part of Virginia kind of helps with that. Knowing that where we came from can help us understand who we are now and perhaps shed light on where we want to go. As in many aspects of the distant past, there is controversy here and there, but most scholars believe that Qumran, where these scrolls were found, hosted a community of Jews who were very devout and very disciplined. Most uh, call them the Essenes. And there is writing from a first century Jewish historian, Josephus, that describes the Essenes as very virtuous and strict. They are part of what's called Second Temple Judaism for about 600 years. Um, after the return from the exile, about 500 BCE, until the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70. If you've read much of the Gospels, you have probably heard two words that may ring bells, Pharisees and Sadducees. They were out to get Jesus. They're usually the bad guys. Many of us don't realize that in first century Israel and Palestine, there were three major strands to Judaism, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, some of whom lived in the community at Qumran. Many books and articles have been written in the past 75 years about possible connections between Jesus and the ideas 
of the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are some similarities between things found in the scrolls relating to sectarian practice and words of Jesus from the biblical gospels. At the end of a short article about views on poverty and matrimony from Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, one scholar wrote, where did Jesus learn the Essene doctrines? It seems quite probable that he was exposed to direct Essene preaching, which influence is evident in many gospel passages. However, in the matter of sharing of wealth, it seems he was also a disciple of John the Baptist, himself a follower of a certain, certain uh, Essene principles. He who, and Jesus says in Luke 3, he who has two coats, let him share with him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. An ancient stone slab that's sometimes called the Dead Sea Scrolls in stone, uh, it came to light and was thought to have been originally found in those caves near the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is reliably dated as 100 years before Christ. On it, there is language that talks about the suffering servant that we also hear about and heard about this morning from Isaiah 53. And language like we hear Jesus use in predicting his own suffering, death, and resurrection in Mark chapter 8 that Ted read. There are multiple references on this stone to a new covenant with God. What is especially controversial about this stone, which is called the Gabriel Revelation, is that 100 years before Christ, there is a suffering servant figure talking about something major happening in three days, those words translated. The phrase, in three days, is mentioned several times on this stone slab that predates Jesus by a hundred years. And one scholar fills in the blanks of the missing fragments to assert that it says, in three days I will live. The provocative question arises, were resurrection predictions before Jesus' time? Were they present before Jesus' time? This volatile question has been fresh for the past 15 years, and trust me, I will not try to answer it. The Bible is a living document. Of course, Christians believe that the Holy Spirit brings the word to life inside us. But it is also changing in its physical form. In 1984, if you can believe it, uh, some of you can't remember that, that far back, but in 1984, when I first visited Yale Divinity School, where I ended up going to seminary, I passed a door when I first entered. On the right, I remember it vividly. Uh, with a sign on the door, it was a simple sign, it said, the RSV room. And I laughed and I joked, ha ha, that must be where they wrote the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, ha 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 ha. And my tour guide seriously said, it is where they met to translate it. I was mortified. That was the translation of my childhood, perhaps some of you too, and later during college and in seminary. In high school youth group, I read the Living Bible, which is a paraphrase of the English instead of a translation from the original language. That's a nuance that you may not care about, but those original languages are Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. In 1989, two years, after I graduated from seminary, the new revised standard version of the Bible was published. And that is the translation that's in the pews here at South Plains and at many, many Protestant churches. In 2011, a major new English translation called the Common English Bible was published 
the CEB translators referenced some of the Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts that weren't around when the RSV was uh, translated. They were sort of around when the NRSV was. Uh, so as they developed the CEB, this was a Bible intended for 21st century speakers and readers of English. <clears throat> 20 years ago, I would not have believed that I would carry around multiple translations of the Bible in a phone that fits in my pocket. The Bible is both ancient and new. Scholars are still exploring the Dead Sea Scrolls and a myriad of other sources to draw ever closer, the hope is, ever closer to understanding God's word to us and for us today, as well as how people encountered God in the past. I encourage all of us to take seriously the fact that the Bible was put together by real people, real communities of people who decided what was in, what was canon, and what was not. And that it has been and continues to be translated by human beings looking at the best manuscripts that they can, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. When we acknowledge this rich past and diligent present, we can avoid, I think, some of the pitfalls of some Christian communities who think that it is somehow possible, it is not in my opinion, somehow possible to skip 2,000 years of history, go from Christian communities, uh, from uh, the practice, faith and practice that leap all the way from Paul and the early church all the way to 1950s American Christianity. We have all heard the saying, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The Dead Sea Scrolls remind us that we are part of a stream that goes back millennia. The Bible in the pew racks right in front of you traces back not only to Paul and Jesus, but to strict sectarians living in desert, caring for their library in clay jars, and further back to the people who could not read or write, but who told the stories of faith over and over that conveyed the truth of God's love and power across the generations. Of course, it is much more than a book that ties us to those children of God in the past. As we gather around this table in a moment, guided by the Holy Spirit, we hear echoes of reformers in Geneva gathering four times a year only for communion of monks and nuns singing chants as they prepare to eat the bread and drink from the cup, and to persecuted Christians in the first century gathered in homes or even in the catacomb tombs to share this same sacred meal. The communion table itself recalls the time before the new covenant in Christ back to our Jewish forebears sacrificing animals at the temple altar. Jesus changed that. No more sacrifices are needed. And through the Lord's Supper, we have a taste of our unity with all the children of God. No, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not dead. They are very much alive. Thanks be to God.